I was just getting it on your page so I could share it once it starts. Yep. Good afternoon, friends. I'm Dr. Ajay Shah. Today on this weekend live, I'm bringing you a special, special guest. She's a best-selling author. She's a whole food plant-based, no oil vegan chef. She's an international speaker. Now she has more than 100,000 YouTube followers. She's a great, great influencer when it comes down to the health of Americans. She's my mentor. She's my wife's mentor. Matter of fact, my, myself, my wife are learning every day from her page how to promote this healthy lifestyle movement. My wife's many of her recipes has the, gotten the ideas from her recipes. So we are very, very indebted to her, what she has contributed to our page and to our life. She also is a great empowerment for many, many women. She's actually a role model for many women and many men who are starting to get into healthy cooking. Um, and actually, frankly, she has a 30 year old person energy. Over last, uh, since, last, uh, since COVID-19 started, over last seven, eight months, she tirelessly has brought hundreds of guests, as I understand, more than 300 guests on her page as a great service to us as Americans to learn about how to live healthy, how to cook healthy, and how to eat healthy. But to be honest with you, the most important thing is I sincerely believe that I was truly named after her name. And that <laughs> Chef AJ. Welcome, Chef AJ. Thank you. Yes, we have the best name, don't we? <laughs> and, and it's funny, we didn't talk to each other and we're both wearing red today. So great minds must think alike. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Welcome. So I want to start with every lot of lot of our followers and viewers know you, but I still want people to know your health journey. How did you start? And I know it, but a lot of our viewers still need to know because you are a living example of how one can turn around when it comes down to health journey. Yeah, absolutely. If anything, um, I apologize, my little doggy is <laughs> on it up. Yeah, so I think what my journey shows is that it's never too late. I'm 60 years old. And thank you for saying I have the energy of a 30 year old, right? Because I think it has to do with the fact that I've been completely plant based, plant exclusive for over 43 years now. But I wasn't always a healthy person. As a matter of fact, up until the age of 52, which was eight years ago, I was obese. And I was obese from the age of five. And most of those years was as a vegan. So the, the worst part, though, wasn't just that I was obese was that I actually was not in good health. I was diagnosed with precancerous colon cancer in, at the age of 43 when I was bleeding in, from every time I would, I would use the restroom and they couldn't remove the polyps during a, a regular you know, colonoscopy because of the state of ill health of my colon. And so they wanted me to come back for surgery. And I did not want to do that because I am afraid of doctors and surgery. It's funny because everybody in my family, from my brothers to my grandfather, to all my uncles, to all my cousins and nieces and nephews are doctors. But I actually truly have like fear of an actual fear of doctors. And I think part of it came from the fact that when I was a teenager, I was going to the hospital for, for what was supposed to be one of those same day operations, a very minor surgery. And I ended up allergic to the anesthesia. And I ended up being resuscitated. Thank God I didn't go on a ventilator. I, I started breathing on my own, but was supposed to be a few hours in the hospital, ended up two months. And so since that time, I've been deathly afraid of doctors, hospitals, procedures, taking medication, even going to the dentist. And so when they said I was going to have to take drugs and have surgery, I'm like, uh uh, nope. And luckily, uh, there was no, if there was an internet back then in 2003, I didn't have it. And Neil Barnard and PCR may have existed, but I didn't know about this. But as luck would have it, I just needed some time to think. And I decided to take a week off my job and just go somewhere to think. And I wanted to go to a spa like Rancho La Puerta in Mexico, where I actually have the privilege of, of working now occasionally or, or presenting, but it was too expensive. So I found this discount spa magazine. There was this place and still there, and it's a wonderful place, by the way, in Lemon Grove, California, also in Austin, Texas, called the Optimum Health Institute. And it was only $875 a week. And I'm like, well, I can afford that. So I went there not knowing that it was gonna change my life because when you get there, you find out that it is a place of, of healing. And what they do is they take people with, all, I, I, some people just go there for like a cleanse or just a vacation, but they have, a lot of people come there that are very sick. And there were people there 
with things like lupus and Lyme's disease, even cancers. And every Friday, it's technically a three-week program, but I only did a week at a time. And they have these testimonials, how eating the food that they served, which was whole food, plant exclusive, without sugar or oil or flour or alcohol or salt. Now, in this case, it was 100% raw as well, healed these people of these diseases, which they were told were incurable. And I'm listening to these people and I'm thinking, well, I don't even really have cancer yet. I have something that they're calling pre-cancer that, that, that will turn into cancer. And I changed my, right then I changed from a junk food vegan diet where I was actually having Coke Slurpees instead of breakfast every day with eight pumps of vanilla syrup and Dr. Pepper big gulps for lunch. I mean, I was vegan. But just because you're vegan doesn't mean you're healthy because French fries are vegan and you can have vegan. I mean, now, oh my God, when I went vegan in 1977, we didn't even have plant milk, you know? Now you can buy it at the 99 cent store all across the United States. I mean, they have everything now vegan, but it's mostly junk food. And so I went from eating a junk food vegan diet to a whole food vegan diet where the food was unprocessed, the way it's found in nature without sugar, oil, flour, alcohol, salt, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And within about six months, I had gone back to the gastroenterologist to have a repeat colonoscopy. And he told me that my colon was now clean, clear, pink, and vascular like a newborn baby. And he accused me of having the surgery somewhere else out of network. And I said, no, of course not. I don't have, why would I do that? No. He goes, well, then where are the polyps? Because they had a photograph of every single one, how many centimeters they were. And he, I said, well, you know, I just changed my diet. This was in 2003. And he said, well, that's impossible. And there was another gastroenterologist assisting him. I think she was from India because of her accent. She goes, I believe you. And right then a light bulb, like Oprah Winfrey talks about a light bulb moment went off and I'm like, you know, there's something to this diet thing. And, and so I actually took a leave of absence from my job. At the time I was an activity director at a retirement home to go to culinary school. And I wasn't planning on being a chef or chef AJ. I wanted to go because the food that you get at the Optimal Health Institute is pretty bland and there's no, there's really no seasoning. And it's, it, I mean, it's, it's a great healing diet, but I didn't think I could eat that the rest of my life. So I said, you know, if I'm going to eat healthfully, it's going to have to take, taste a little better. So I went to culinary school just to learn how to cook healthy food better. And then as they say, the rest was history. Wow. Such an amazing, amazing story and journey. So much to learn from you. And I think uh, I think you always have told me, and I remember still from our first uh, live on your page, uh, that uh, everybody needs to eat. And every knowledge is important, but knowledge doesn't feed our hunger. We all need to eat food. And when it comes down to eating food, if it doesn't taste good, even the healthy food, we will not continue eating. And many doctors actually are great at giving us the knowledge and writing prescriptions and doing procedures. But many doctors are not good at teaching us how to cook tasty and healthy food. And you bring that combination so well. So I have told you before, but I tell it again to unlive on my base that you actually go beyond where many doctors have gone. So that's a great, great thank you. Big thank you to you. So yeah, let's yeah. start with, uh, with the wealth of knowledge you have. And like I, I said, again, I think the knowledge you have gathered, even though coming out as a chef and as a, as a cook, as a chef, that the knowledge you have gathered and the books you have written are as equal, if not more than most doctors who do only get about five hours of uh, nutrition education. So please tell us your views on what we eat in America as a standard American diet. Well, most of it, most of it, believe it or not, isn't even food because I read that Americans eat something like 67 to 72% of their calories from processed food, which I don't think is really food. You know, I love how Dr. Hans Diehl, the founder of the CHIP program says something to the effect of, if it comes from a plant, eat it. If it's manufactured in a plant, don't eat it. And I had the privilege of interviewing Elaine Lalane, the wife of Jack Lalane on my show. And even though they weren't vegan, he actually was vegetarian, she's not vegan. They knew a long time ago, like 80 years ago, that processed food wasn't food. And so one of the reasons I think I'm allowed to speak at places that aren't just plant-based, some of these spas, and cruise ships that hire me is because even though I would prefer people to be 100% plant-based, I know that's probably not possible, but my message is that even if you eat animal products, why are you eating processed food? It's not food, it's readily available, it's socially acceptable, it's easily affordable, but it's not food. Food is supposed to come 
from the ground, from the earth. It's not supposed to come from, you know, a, a factory. And, you know, I, I've been interviewing many doctors for a summit that I have that I'm hosting in November called the GI Health Summit. And they all talk about this idea of not just processed food, but ultra processed food and how it's linked to not just GI disease, but so many of these diseases. And we are not meant to eat food that way. There was a something you can find on the internet if you Google it, it has a funny name, from mouth to anus. And I believe it was a grad student who had someone swallow a capsule that you can do that and you can track digestion all the way down. And they showed what happened when they ate food, as we know as food, real food. And they showed what happened when they ate processed food. Like I think it was something like Gatorade or, um, or you know, or ramen noodles, a typical meal that a, a college student would eat. And when they ate the processed food, it was like the stomach was confused. It was like it, it digestion stopped. It didn't know what to do with it. And, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And yes, we, I mean, you know, if there was a famine and that's all you could get was Twinkies, of course you should eat the Twinkies. But when you have a choice, processed food, in my opinion, it, for best health should be eliminated completely or at least greatly minimized because people are eating that instead of eating fruits and vegetables. And they say that Americans eat something like less than 10% of their calories from fruits and vegetables, some 3%, some Americans eat no vegetables. And these are the foods that are linked to optimal health. You know, to, you know, people say, oh, your skin's so great. You know, well, it's, it's the vegetables. <laughs> no, those are excellent points. And I like the way you emphasize on the processed food, because uh, I think, like you said, many of the blue zones, you know, they do have some small animal products but they essentially don't have any processed food. So I think processed food is the main, main culprit in terms of obesity epidemic, many of the chronic disease. So I think one message for sure from our live today is that cut down on the processed food as much as you can. And obviously if you can go animal products free, that would be best, but processed food definitely needs to go. So that brings to, you know, the favorite thing which you've been promoting is the whole food plant-based. People, like you said, people who don't eat a lot of plant-based food, and if they want to start, please describe to them that what it means to be whole food, plant-based, no oil. That means what type of food we should be eating, what type of food we should be avoiding. Right. Okay. Would you? I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Would you mind if I add one thing to what we just said about the processed food? Mm -hmm. It's that one of the reasons I think it's so difficult for people to not eat it is the fact that it is addictive. And there have been many books written on this subject. One was by a former... A, uh, was the head of the FDA when uh, Bill Clinton was president. His name was, it was called the Adapted Dr. David Kessler. The book was called The End of Overeating. And then there was another book called Salt, Sugar, and Fat, How the Food Giants Hooked Us by investigative journalist and Pulitzer Prize winning author, Michael Moss. And in both these books, they talked about how sugar, fat, and salt were addicted by themselves, but even more so when they were put together, layered, and loaded into these hyperpalatable hedonic foods that create a bliss point in the brain of people eating them. That's why people that are old enough to remember a famous commercial for Lay's potato chips, bet you can't eat just one and you can't. And so what, what people don't realize is that, that they become, it's like having an addiction to, to the stimulation, this artificial stimulation of dopamine in the brain from the sugar, fat, and salt from eating these foods. And so even, I know that there are people that that's all they can afford to eat and we need to fix that in this country, but there are people who have the means to eat healthier. And by the way, things like beans and rice, if you go to an ethnic store are about 49 cents a pound, but the pull is to eat these foods because they're perceived as delicious because they're stimulating all this dopamine in the brain. Whereas if you eat the healthy foods, People say they don't taste good because they don't stimulate that amount of dopamine in the brain. So to answer the question you just asked, the foods that I think people, the human people should eat are fruits, any kind of fruit, any kind of vegetable, any kind of whole grain, any kind of legume, beans, slip peas, lentils. And then depending on their weight, you know, nuts, seeds, and avocado, very healthy, but sometimes people have to kind of minimize them if they're struggling with food addictions and weight. But these are, this is actual food, you know, if it was in the garden of Eden, then eat it. If it was in, <laughs> you know, the 7-Eleven, probably don't eat it. No, that's an excellent point. We had Dr. Montgomery yesterday, Baxter Montgomery yesterday, and he actually said the same thing, that this actually is not a standard American diet, actually it's a standard American drugs, because this diet has a similar effects 
to many of those addictive drugs. I mean, they almost behave like an addiction, like you described. I mean, people actually crave for it. People actually, he was saying that uh, in Houston, when there was this uh, hurricane thing going on, these people actually were almost uh, looting the shops because they could not uh, go without that processed addictive food. So it's definitely a drug-like effect when we eat processed food, I agree with you. So that brings a major question. You know, a lot of us, including my family, we were vegetarian, we became vegan, but it was very hard to give up on oil. So mm -hmm. please give us your views on oil. Obviously, so, uh, yeah, so uh, absolutely. So, so one of the things I do is I work with people that suffer from food addictions and are trying to lose weight. So let's just, let, let's look at oil a couple of different ways. If you believe what I believe, which is what Jack LaLanne has been saying for over 80 years, if God made it, eat it. If man made it, don't eat it. Oil is a highly processed food. My litmus test on whether I need a food, or I eat a food is whether or not I can make it in my kitchen easily. Now, there are people that will tell you, well, yeah, I know how to make maple syrup, but how many people really can go out and tap a maple tree and get 40 gallons of sap and boil it down to get one gallon of maple syrup? If you're in that business, you probably can, but the rest of us can't. Has anyone ever made olive oil or corn oil or flax oil? It's a very highly, it's a highly processed procedure, often using harmful chemicals called lye. You know, if you think about it, you take an orange, you can squeeze it or a lemon and out comes juice. What happens when you squeeze corn or when you squeeze olives or flax seeds? Nothing. And so the first thing I would say is, and again, I'm not against fat, even though I eat a very low fat diet for reasons of weight loss maintenance and because fat is very triggering for me and I, I have a hard time moderating use of it. I'm not against whole food fats like nuts, seeds, and avocado. The thing is, when, when you, if there is anything that people feel like they really have to have because it's in the flax oil or the olive oil, wouldn't it be in the whole food? Does anything magical happen in the processing of a whole food to a processed food that makes it healthier? If anything, the opposite occurs because when you process a food, you make it nutrient poor and calorie rich because you're removing the most important components of the food. You're removing the water and the fiber. You're also removing the vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, antioxidants, and micronutrients. So if you feel there is something in olive oil or corn oil or any oil that you must have for your health, then why not eat it in its whole food form where you get all the benefits of the micronutrients and the water in the fiber. The other thing is, is a, you make it so much more calorie rich. Now, Americans, they say something like 70% of us are overweight. When I've interviewed Dr. Joel Furman, he says the numbers are skewed. It's more like 90%. So who among us can really afford to be eating something that's 4,000 calories per pound? Processed oils, regardless of what kind, whether it's coconut or olive or flax or corn, are the most calorically dense foods on the planet. Now, vegetables have up to 100 calories a pound. It's pretty hard to overeat on them. But oil, a mere tablespoon of any kind of oil has 140 calories, about 14 grams of fat, half of those which are saturated. And our government says we don't have any need in our diet for any saturated fat. For the same amount of calories in a tablespoon of oil, you can have two pounds of tomatoes or zucchini or almost a whole pound of fruit. The other thing is, is oil, because there's no fiber, it doesn't make you feel full. People think, oh, if I eat more fat, I'll feel full. And the very and really interesting guest, if you'd like to interview him, I love this man. His name is Dr. Terry Shintani. And he took over Dr. McDougall's practice in Hawaii. And he was the one that explained that the reason that people perceive that they feel more full on fat is because of the high calorie density. Fat is nine calories per gram as opposed to carbohydrates and protein, which is four calories a gram. So it's more than double the caloric density. So of course, anytime you eat more calories, you're going to feel fuller than if you eat fewer calories. But the thing about oil that's, well, you know, I haven't even mentioned the work of Dr. Esselstyn, where he talks about this in the movie Forks Over Knives. And of course, in his book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, how he believes, and I, I believe too, that oil is deleterious to the to the to your vasculature that it injures your endothelial cells which is the life jacket of your circulatory system but even if it wasn't you know relevant with heart disease it is just so so calorically dense and it doesn't make you feel full because with the lack of fiber it doesn't activate what's known as the stretch receptors in your stomach we have in our stomach in a great book by the way about this is called the pleasure trap by doctors lyle and goldhammer we have stretch nutrient and calorie receptors 
And oil slips under the radar undetected by these mechanisms of satiety because it can't activate the nutrient receptors because there's virtually no nutrients in oil, maybe the tracest amount of vitamin E. There's, it, it can't activate the stretch receptors. You'd have to drink an unthinkable amount because it's, it, it, there's no fiber to make you feel full. And by the time it would activate the calorie receptors, you've already overeaten. They have done, I wish I could find where I learned this because, because this was an actual video, but they've done experiments where they've given people the same meal and one had 500 calories worth of oil and one didn't. So for example, and this is why restaurant eating, and, and I, I, I mean, I feel bad for restaurants going out of business, but one good thing that came out of it, at least for my clients, is once they stopped eating at restaurants because they've been forced to these last seven months, they have finally lost weight because restaurants use more sugar, fat, and salt than you ever would at home. And, it, and you don't, you can't sense it. So for example, if you were to make a meal at home, let's say you made a like a gluten-free brown rice pasta with some steamed vegetables and an oil-free marinara, and you would have a certain amount of food, it'd be a certain amount of calories. But you do that same thing as if they were making it at a restaurant or even at home, with the way the restaurant would make it is there's gonna be oil and salt in the water that they boil the pasta in. When the pasta comes out, they're gonna put more oil on it. And then the marinara sauce is probably gonna have a cup of oil in it. And then the vegetables will probably have butter and oil in it. So you have these two meals that are identical. They look the same. They're identical in volume. They weigh the same. One is 500 calories more, but the people in the study, they detected no more fullness from 500 calories of oil. And that can be very significant, especially if you're overweight or trying to lose weight, that here you've eaten 500 calories and you don't even know it. So, you know, I've, I've interviewed Dr. Susan Roberts at uh, She's got a laboratory at Tufts University where she literally takes restaurant food and figures out how many calories it is. And she says they always underestimate it, even when they put it in the, in, you know, on the menu and that people tend to overeat by 500 to 1000 calories more than they intended when they eat at restaurants and they generally don't make it up. So, you know, oil is one of the things that if you are struggling with your weight, it's really one of the easiest things to get rid of because it, it really has no taste. Think about it. How many people do you know that go around drinking olive oil? I don't know anybody. By itself, it doesn't taste very good. And the truth is, is when you use oil, it coats the taste buds of your tongue so that you can't really taste the food. So guess what? You got to use a lot more salt now. And then you have what I call the evil trinity, the sugar, fat, and salt. So the, the nice thing to know though, is it's completely possible and actually quite easy to cook and bake without oil. There's so many substitutes. I mean, the only thing you can't quote do without oil is deep fry, which we don't want to do anyway. We have a machine called, I have a machine called an air fryer that makes the most delicious crisp French fries out of just potatoes or sweet potatoes. I was a pastry chef at a restaurant for five years. I didn't use oil. There are other things you can use like prune puree, apple butter, pumpkin, bananas, applesauce. So it, it's really of, of, of oil, sugar, and salt, it's probably the easiest thing to get rid of. Plus the fact that if you feel like you miss it in salad dressings, you can still use things that have that fatty mouthfeel like tahini or, or uh, nut butters or avocado. So I think that oil is a triumph of marketing over science. And I, I would, this will be, you since you love interviewing people, you might really enjoy this guy. His name is Dr. Nick Delgado. And he actually has a YouTube video called How I Became Diabetic in Six Hours, where he literally just kept drinking olive oil and he takes his blood every hour. And it basically shows that during that time he had diabetes. So again, I, you know, people think they need something because of what they see on TV or what they hear, but it's really not true. You don't need oil. Yes, you need fat, but guess what? If you eat food, there's fat in everything. There's trace amounts of fat, even in fruit. Greens have about 3% of their calories from fat and oats are about 20% fat. So I personally have never seen a person with a fat deficiency. Have you, doctor? <laughs> well, this was such a great, great response in terms of oil. I've read a lot of things about oil. I watched a lot of YouTube videos, but you covered it so well. And I think I agree with you. I think, obviously, I think my wife already told you that we became oil-free because of you. And today you proved it, that how much convincing power you have to everyone about going without oil. So that's a great, great response. So let's talk about the next uh, next nutrient, which uh, many people talk about. It. My personal trainer, every time he comes to our house, first thing he asks me about that nutrient, and that's protein. He always asks me, Dr. Shah, did you get enough protein today? So what are your views on protein? Do we get more than what we need? 
And then uh, what should be the source of protein in terms of animal source versus plant-based source, plus and minus? Okay, I, I'm so sorry. I got to say one more thing about oil because you remind me of something. When I lived in LA, I did a lot of consultations with restaurants on their menu to try to get healthier options. And I explained to them what, what the problem was with oil. And there was, there was a restaurant that, that took, that they read the China study, they were very interested in health. And so they started removing oil from many of their dishes, like their marinara sauce, their tikka masala sauce, their salad dressings, their soups. But they didn't want to say anything because they, they didn't want their clientele to think the food was going to be different. No one noticed. No one noticed. And if anything, they said the food tasted cleaner, brighter, and better. And then they have like a secret no oil menu. But but that's the, the fact is, is that oil doesn't make food taste better. It just makes it more fattening. And, you know, and it just makes you, you know, it makes you like it more because of the high caloric density. So protein. 40, more than 43 years as a vegan, I used to have this t-shirt. I um, basically said, yes, I get enough protein. If I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me if I got enough protein, I, I'd be a millionaire now. There, just like there's fat in everything, there is protein in everything. All the largest land mammals, from the dinosaur to the elephant, to the rhinoceros, to the giraffe, all the large ones, they're herbivores. They don't eat animals. The ones that, the ones that are carnivores, they're the real tiny ones, right? So that, that's number one. You, I have spoken at many conferences and even a few times at Kaiser Permanente, sometimes where doctors can get CEUs and there've been like 300 doctors in the audience. And I'll say, has any one of you ever treated a patient for protein deficiency, which is Corky Arshur? And in all the times I've given that talk, only one hand went up and this was a, this was a child abuse case. So the person did not have enough calories. It just doesn't exist, just like fatty acid deficiency, just like calcium deficiency. Dr. McDougall talks about this all the time. We have like this fear model of deficiency model and everybody is so worried about deficiencies when the true problem with our obesity epidemic and our heart disease epidemic and our cancer diabetic and our, you know, all the, di all the uh, 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 epidemics, I mean, not diabetics, but the diabetes epidemic is excesses. And people are so worried about not getting enough when the reality is they get too much. Think about a little baby. You know, that is the time that you would think they need a lot of protein. That's when they've got to grow. But breast milk has it's something like less than 10% of its calories from protein. So again, triumph of marketing over science. Thank goodness that we have all these wonderful plant-based doctors that focus in a little different area. So we have that wonderful book by Garth Davis called Proteinaholic, where he debunks that myth. But again, I feel that people, people want to hear good news about their bad habits, like Dr. McDougall says. And people like meat. I mean, some people, some people just really like the taste of flesh and, you know, they feel they need it and they feel they feel better with it. And, you know, I love how Dr. Furman says, well, feeling better doesn't mean getting better. And, you know, the truth is, is people that are raised vegan or vegetarian, they don't crave meat and they don't want to eat it. They think it's disgusting. And I love how uh, Harvey Diamond, I believe was his name. He wrote a book a long time ago, Fit for Life. And he said, you know, uh, take a take a bunny rabbit and take a carrot and put it in a playpen with a kid. And if the kid eats the bunny and plays with the carrot, I'll buy you a new car. You know, we 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 are not we're not obligate carnivores like cats or mountain lions. Yes, we have these little canine teeth, but we can't rip flesh with them. It has to be killed by somebody else and cooked usually by somebody else for us to even be able to chew it. So, you know, I guess true or omnivores, we can eat meat. We've adapted to it and our ancestors probably did eat a little meat. They ate the weak, the slow, the sick, the isolated, the injured, but we didn't have refrigeration. So with this hunting and gathering, yeah, when there was a kill, people would eat it, but it wasn't like people were eating dead animals three times a day, like they are now bacon and eggs for, you know, for breakfast and, you know, cheeseburger or bacon cheeseburger for lunch and, you know, steak or some other kind of meat for chicken. We never ate that much animal protein. And, and, the, and the protein that they're eating now, I even hate, I almost you don't, don't even like the word because, you know, I, I almost never go to restaurants, but it always would drive me crazy when I would go to a restaurant, say for example, and order a salad or order some vegetables. And they go, you want any protein with that? As if like, that's what makes the meal. Like, like there is, this is, there is protein in this. I don't have to order extra protein. There's more consequences having too much protein in many cases than not enough. And of course you need enough, but you know what? If you eat a whole food plant-based diet and enough calories, there's no way you're not going to get enough protein. And if you're worried, then eat the foods that have a little more, like the legumes, like the quinoa. I've never met anybody that had protein deficiency in my life. 
Oh, that's an excellent answer. And I agree with you. I think if we eat a whole food, plant-based food with variety of food on our plate, the average protein is about 10 to 15 percent. You know, when you take all different type of food, and if I eat 2,000 calories. That's about uh, 200 to 250 calories from protein. And that gives me my 50 to 60 gram of protein. So I agree. I think if we have adequate calories and if it is enough variety and enough whole food plant based, we would never have a protein deficiency. I 100% agree with you. You know, that brings the very neglected nutrient and probably the most important nutrient is the fiber. So even though I agree that we should not be taking fiber supplements to get the fiber, but what are your views in terms of, you know, plant-based food, which only gives us the fiber, animal-based food does not give any fiber at all. So what is the importance of fiber? And uh, what, what, is, uh, what is an average uh, American eating fiber? I mean, how can they increase fiber in their diet? Yeah, that is so funny because before I decided on this shirt, the shirt I almost wore was the one that said fiber is the new protein. And, and I think about the time that I was on the cruise as a speaker and uh, this uh, somebody that wasn't on the vegan part of the cruise is very sorry that I keep my dog is flat and she, her hair is getting everywhere. So supposedly she was a hypoallergenic dog. So there was this very, very overweight man with a plate of nothing but bacon, like like mounded up right during the breakfast uh, buffet. And I, I had one of you know, one of my shirts on that said I'm vegan. He comes up to me and he goes, well, where do you get your protein? And I'm like, well, where do you get your fiber? You know, I've been interviewing 30 GI doctors for this upcoming GI health summit. And they are all saying that fiber is the not maybe the most important thing, but one of the most important things, especially when it comes to gut health and having a, a, a good microbiome and that something like Two or only two or three percent of Americans even eat enough fiber. Something like 97, 98 percent don't even get the recommended amount, which is actually very, very low. So, you know, the, the thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that the only place you find fiber is in plants. There is no fiber in any animal product. There is no fiber in any processed food unless they've added it back in. And so you don't need, you know, you don't you don't need a fiber supplements or Metamucil. You need to eat fruits and vegetables, whole grains and legumes. And if you eat those, then you will not have a problem going to the bathroom, which a lot of people do. You know, I remember how Dr. Dennis Burkett used to say, America is a constipated nation. And if you pass small stools, you need large hospitals. So I remember when I was even a junk food uh, vegetarian, I, I pooped like once a week. That isn't, that's how I got the beginning of, that's how I got those precancerous polyps. You're not supposed to poop once a week. I promise you. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And I think uh, a lot of doctors and including myself now and learning from you that larger the bowel movement, the longer you live. So I think it has to happen every day, hopefully every morning before you go to work. So I agree with you. Fiber plays a large role. Fiber also gives us this uh, you know, great uh, small chain uh, fatty acid nutrient, which is also obviously so important. So that brings another next uh, next uh, topic, next question. And I would listen to you, listen, uh, learn from your YouTube videos is about the need for omega-6 and omega-3. A lot of Americans are big on taking this omega-3 supplements. You know, there's more and more data coming out that that's not necessary in general. Dr. Clapper has said that also. So what are your views on omega-6, omega-3? And as I understand, if you cut down omega-6 in your diet by eliminating the oil, maybe the ratio will balance out just by taking flaxseed and you may not need those omega-3 supplements. Absolutely. And you know, it's so funny and I apologize. Every time you ask me a question, then I think of another thing to say in the last one. I've got to say one more thing about a pitch for fiber. If you're struggling with weight, fiber is your friend because what fiber does is it's like fen-fen. It tricks the brain that you're feeling full on fewer calories because it has no calories. So I just wanted to put one more plug for fiber with that. And of course, if you're not used to eating it, go slowly. Don't just go from a standard American diet, which by the way, some of the people I've talked to call it the substance abuse diet or even the satanic abuse diet. So don't go from zero to a hundred right away. Slowly start eating these foods, chew them very well as Dr. Clapper says to a cream. But as far as fatty acid, I know that just like all the things you're asking me are, can be very controversial in the world of nutrition and even in the plant-based world. So one of the things I suggest to people is to get a blood test and your doctor can order this test 
And even if you won't, you can actually get it on your own. It's not that expensive. And it is called a fatty acid profile. And it will tell you the exact amount of omega-6, omega-3, DHA, ALA, EPA, the ratio in your blood. So if you are concerned that you have a fatty acid deficiency, a very simple blood test can tell you whether or not you do. And I agree that most people can, can do very well just by having a smaller amount of this omega three fatty fats in their diet, either by a couple of tablespoons of ground flax seeds every day or an ounce of walnuts. But if they're eating a lot of omega-6, like because of eating olive oil, that's that's gonna change their ratio. So the first thing I would say is cut out this all the sixes and then always include the threes. And by the way, there are plant sources that are not nuts and seeds that are very high in omega-3. Greens, for example, and especially one grain called purslane, or if you live in different parts of the world, vertilago, it's a, just a delicious, it's actually a weed, but that is the highest plant source of it. And it's, it, and so that's what I would tell people is to get their blood tested and see if they really have a deficiency. But even if you did, they have algae derived vegan DHA supplements you can take if you, if you decide to do that, or if you need them and you don't have to ever get them from fish oil, because think about it, the fish didn't produce the omega-3s, the fish got it from eating the algae. So cut out the middleman. It's like the cow didn't produce the B12, the cow got it from eating the, the dirt and the grass. Cut out the middleman, always go to the whole food plant source. Yeah, I agree. I think I had my fatty acid analysis done and my ratio six to three was five. So I, it could be better, but like an average American ratio is almost 15 or 20 to one. And I think that's partly because of too much omega-6 and too little omega-3. So I think that your recommendation to check the ratio for whole food plant-based is very, very appropriate. That way we don't have to take any supplements and we can just get our omega-3 from the whole food instead of getting from a supplement. I agree with you. Right. So and if, really if I knew you were gonna ask me this, I could have pulled up my blood test, but I can send them to you if you want. You can see the last couple of years I and what they are. And the doctor just said that they're stellar. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yes, yes. So let's let's not now talk about uh, the cooking itself. I think uh, we talked enough about the nutrition aspect, the health aspect, but I think I want to get your opinion about the cooking. So number one, is it very hard to cook whole food plant-based food? Is this something required that we batch cook on a weekend so that we have you know healthy food available for the whole week? And how do we do this uh, you know healthy uh, healthy whole food plant based grocery shopping? Well, I don't think it's any harder cooking plant based than it is not plant based. I think what can be hard for people if they're used to cooking with oil or a lot of sugar and salt, there there can be a learning curve. Just like when you learn a new language, it, you it takes a little while to get used to it. So I don't think it's necessarily harder. And people often have to learn to use like things that maybe they haven't used before. Things I recommend like the instant pot or even an air fryer or a rice cooker. But I don't think it's hard. I think it's the same. And in many ways, it's easier. I'll tell you, for sure, your cleanup is easier. When you don't have that oil and all that, that grease on your pans, it's a lot easier to clean up. So that's one thing. But, you know, I would recommend batch cooking to everyone, even people that weren't plant-based, because people are busy and they want to have time to do other things than to be shopping and shopping. And so I think batch cooking is the greatest thing people can do just to make sure that food is always ready. You know, there's an old saying that preparation trumps motivation. And especially if you're trying to eat healthy, if all you have in your refrigerator and pantry and cabinets is healthy food, when you're hungry, you will eat it. So I'm a big fan of, of batch prepping, you know, soups, stews, chili, eating some one day, saving some in the refrigerator for a few days as another meal, leftovers, and also freezing them. That's something that I've always done. And I also batch cook grains like rice. You can do batch cook legumes too in your Instant Pot. You can even buy canned salt-free beans. Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I love to, you know, batch cook big trays of potatoes and sweet potatoes, and then I can repurpose them into so many different meals. But I don't think, you know, and also now with YouTube, and it, it, it's, 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 it's not any harder to cook plant-based. You have to learn to not use oil, but there's really nothing more to it than not using oil. <laughs> it's not, it really is that easy. You know, you can saute in water or broth or, or, you know, really any kind of liquid or depending on what pan you have, no liquid. But I don't, I don't think it's harder to cook plant-based. I think it's a lot cheaper. There's a misconception that it's expensive. Maybe if you eat at, you know, restaurants all the time. But again, think about the foods that that were traditionally eaten by our ancestors, whole grains, legumes. 
they are so inexpensive. It's ridiculous. You can get a whole, I mean, it, the, it, the, mar, the market by me, with some of the ethnic markets, 49 cents for a pound of beans. I mean, a can of beans at Whole Foods that's salt free can be almost $3, you know? So if you're willing to buy things in bulk and cook them yourself, really, really save a lot of money as well. Yeah, those are great tips. I think that's what we do at our house. And uh, the next question is, you know, many of us are invited, you know, not for last six months, obviously, but uh, to go to different parties in the weekends and, you know, gather at the weddings and other things. And it becomes very, very challenging to be whole food, plant-based, no oil uh, individual. So how do you handle in terms of attending those parties and uh, receptions and weddings and other things. <laughs> Don't go. No, I'm just kidding. You know what? It's going to depend on the person's personality. And even though I may not seem like it, I'm actually kind of a disagreeable person. And so what I do is I bring my food and I just do it just kind of like, like, like a diabetic would bring their medicine or somebody with asthma would bring their inhaler. The food is my medicine. And if I eat somebody else's food, that's not on plan, I'm going to get sick. And so I just bring it everywhere. And if it's not appropriate for me to eat it at the venue, and I've actually, believe it or not, I brought my own food to bar mitzvahs, to weddings. Nobody even really noticed. And that's the funny thing about it. But if, if it was considered inappropriate, then I either wouldn't eat or maybe I'd go out to the car, you know, and have my cooler with me. You can also eat before you go. And I don't love that idea because if I'm not hungry, I don't want to eat before I go. So my answer is if you can arrange it like if for example if it's a potluck i mean nobody's i haven't i haven't seen anybody since march 20th so i don't know where i'm going to eat right now but but when when things open up again if there's a way you can get compliant food like for example like the one of the things we do here is i have a meetup group and we have potlucks and those are the best because then people that want maybe the richer food or you know we don't we don't we just tell people it has to be vegan. We love it when it's SOS free, but we don't want to exclude people. So we say, you can bring anything you want that's vegan, but you must clearly label it because there are people with allergies. And so what's great about potlucks, if you can skew the gathering to that, is you can bring the healthiest food possible in an abundance for other people so that you always will have something to eat. And even when you're invited to somebody's house, you can always offer to bring something. I mean, yes, there's true. Some hosts will say no, but I find... As somebody that has entertained a lot, I find that if you're very specific on your offering, you're more likely to get a yes. So a lot of times when I'm planning a dinner party, I have an idea in my head what I'm going to have. Maybe it's got a Mexican theme or maybe it's a potato bar. So I kind of have an idea. So when somebody on the phone says to me or they text me, can I bring something? I always say no, because I've had this idea in my head. But if somebody says something really specific to me, like, hey, can I bring a large green salad with eight different vegetables that I've grown in my garden? I'm like, yeah, you know what? Then I don't have to make the salad. That sounds really good so that you can be very specific. And then if they still say no, depending on your relationship with the person or how, you know, how badly you want to go, you could say, listen, I'm on a very special diet doctor's orders. Do you think it would be possible for you to just put a couple of potatoes in the oven and or the microwave and make them for me? Or would you mind if I bring my food? I mean, if somebody is going to say, no, you can't, I don't, I wouldn't want to go. I mean, I don't want to be with that person. I mean, maybe it was like the boss's wife or something you, you might have to go, but I do think that the social interaction is, is one of the toughest piece for people, especially if they're women and especially if they're agreeable and people pleasers. So that's just something you're going to have to learn to navigate. And there's, um, there, there's a wonderful book called The Pleasure Trap. And I really recommend everyone read chapter four, where they talk about getting along without going along. Uh, Dr. Lyle talks about how sometimes when we get healthy, especially, God forbid, if we lose weight, it, it bothers the people that are in our Friend, friend and family circle, especially if they stay overweight and sick. It's something that has to do with losing status or perceived loss of status. And so he gives a lot of advice on how to do that. Uh, so that even if you don't like say anything, even if you're not bragging, like, look, I lost all this weight and I'm so healthy. That's what they're feeling because they're still stuck in the pleasure trap. They're still addicted to these foods. And now, you know, it's sort of like it's the same thing happens when people keep quit smoking or drinking and their friends don't. It's like you're no fun anymore. You know, it's 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 sad that that happens. But then I would say to somebody, well, are they really your friends? If they only want to be friends with you, if you're drinking or eating crappy food, was that really like a relationship that's that's worth keeping? So it's going to depend on the individual. But my answer is my health 
is more important to me than your feelings. And not that I will hurt your feelings, but I'm not going to eat something that is off plan that's going to send me into a tailspin, back into the pleasure trap, just to make you feel better. That makes no sense to me. Wow, such a great, great answer. I think, uh, like, like you clearly said, that my health is very important and food is my medicine. So just like you said, you know, we take medicine. If somebody was diabetic, they would take their you know, insulin before their meal and they would take the insulin even at the party. So same way you bring your own food. And I think, like you said, I think if, if, if it's uh, somebody's feelings are hurt, maybe that person truly is not your friend. I think when you have unconditional love between the friends, they're not going to worry what you eat and how you eat. I think they're going to worry only about the unconditional love. I agree with you. So that brings up the most important question that you have written the whole book on it. And many women are looking for those tips. And please give your top tips if a woman wants to start losing weight from tomorrow, it's like a burning question right now. Okay, well, on the back of my book, there's a little chart. Let's see if I can hold it there so you can see it. The calorie density chart. And really in a, in a nutshell, eat to the left of the red line. So very simply put, every time you eat food, whatever else you're eating, if you would make sure that half of that plate is non-starchy vegetables, you are gonna dilute the overall calorie density of the meal so that you're going to lose weight. So that's, that's, that's the most abbreviated version of a 300 page book on calorie density. Increase the calorically dilute but nutrient rich foods, which are fruits and vegetables, primarily vegetables. And you do that at every meal, you will feel fuller because of all the water and fiber we talked about before during our oil discussion and and you'll have a large volume of food and you'll, you still can eat some of the other stuff, but that's going to lower or dilute the overall calorie density of every meal so that you can lose weight without going hungry. Cause it's pretty easy to lose weight. You just have to eat less calories. But if you do that, you're going to be pretty miserable because you're going to be hungry. But if you follow the calorie density approach, you can actually eat twice as much food and still take in half as many calories. And so the answer to that is eating vegetables and eating way more vegetables. And I eat right, right now, I eat two pounds a day minimum. And that's one pound raw, like in the form of a salad and one pound cooked. But when I was heavier and losing weight, I was probably eating four pounds a day or more. You just can't go wrong with eating vegetables. Wow. No, I think that's the number one tip. And I think I, I highly recommend everyone to buy your book, read the book. My wife has it. I, I read it and watch all your YouTube videos. And that brings the ultimate question. Every person, man and woman, want to know how you keep up with all this energy, how you spend your day, what do you eat? And I know you have a YouTube video half an hour long. But today, in a few minutes, please describe your typical day in terms of what you eat, how much uh, Facebook and YouTube lives you do, how much exercise you do, how much you sleep, because a lot of people, including men and women, can mimic some of the things you do and look as great as you. Yep. Well, thank you. Well, it's a, um, since the pandemic, my schedule is a little bit different than it was before. You know, I don't, I, I, the only thing I can think of, because I get that a lot, where do you get your energy? I think it's from the healthy habits. I really do. I don't take any stimulants in the form of caffeine or any depressants in the form of alcohol. And, and I think that the food I eat really does give me the energy that I need to do everything I need to do. So a typical day, I, I, I really, you know, it's not just, it's not just diet. It's, it's, it's diet, sleep and exercise and, and sunshine too. It's like, it's more than that. You need all four of those things, I believe. And one of the things that really changed for me in the last few years is I never emphasized sleep. I never thought it was that important. And I would burn the candle at both ends and stay up too late, which would cause me to eat at night because I was trying to keep myself awake. But ever since I made going to bed by 10 o'clock a non-negotiable, that really helped. And I don't always fall asleep at 10. My phone reminds me Sometimes I don't fall asleep until 11, but the idea is, is that I'm in bed by 10. And I mean, I've had people over and I've said, okay, you guys do what you want. I'm going to bed. I mean, I really do go to bed at 10 because I learned from one of the doctors, Dr. Linda Carney, that whatever those wonderful things that happen in sleep, where like you're, literally your brain is being cleaned, that the most powerful time is between 10 a.m. and midnight, that those two hours mean more than all the other hours of sleep. And, and she, she backed this up with scientific data. And when I heard that a few years ago, I, I, I changed things and I stopped watching TV at night. That's the other thing. I find <laughs> it's not that I never watch a program. 
but I don't watch television. I've never watched the news my whole life. And when I moved to the desert two years ago, I moved here three months before my husband and I never learned to turn the TV on and I still don't know how. And that's one of the best things. I always joke if my husband dies, I'll never watch TV. I really, I literally, it's some new system. I cannot turn the television on. If I mean, it's so, so I don't watch regular TV. Yes, we'll watch a show on Netflix, you know, intentionally. So that really helps because I, and I don't spend that much time on social media. You would think that I do, but other than doing these broadcasts, I'm not on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. I mean, I have people that help me post, but I, I really don't do it. It's just a big time suck and a time waster. Fortunately, I do pay a little bit of words with friends because I really like it, but that is that is my one guilty pleasure. So I'm um, in bed by 10, alarm is set by six, but I almost always wake up at 5.55 a.m. It's the weirdest thing. And sometimes I, I don't just bound out of bed, but sometimes I lollygag, you know, from till seven, I get up, but it's very hot here in the desert. So I have to walk my dog pretty early if I want to go for an hour walk. So that's my first priority. You know, I'll do some little things around the house, empty the dishwasher, get my husband's breakfast, get my dog's breakfast, but get her out. And then I spend special time with her before it gets too hot going for a walk and sitting out. And then nine o'clock, I am on that spin bike, spinning, standing up for an hour. That's when I listen to all the podcasts because whatever guest I am going to interview, I want to know as much about them as possible. So I'm either listening to their book on Audible or listening to some of their podcasts. And I do that from nine to 10. 10 to 11 is when I'm showering and getting ready for the 11 o'clock show, which I do every day. And I've done every day since March 20th. 12 to one is lunch. I think it's important to take a lunch hour, you know, I mean, you know, these people that have these jobs where they get like 30 minutes, that is not enough to really eat the food properly and digest it. And lunch today was a henna yam roasted about a pound and a half, actually delicious with about a pound of broccoli. It was actually 12 ounces. Unfortunately, Trader Joe's broccoli organic is my favorite and it comes in 12 ounce bags. And I really would prefer 16 ounces, but I had to make do with 12. So I'll be full now until dinner time, which is almost always five hours after lunch, whatever time that is. So one plus five is probably six o'clock. Um, I'm doing this broadcast now. I have another one. Usually I have about two, two to three a day. So it's not that I'm always broadcasting, but because I host these summits, I'm interviewing wonderful doctors like yourself. So, and then when I'm not doing that, then I'm editing the videos, which takes a really long time because you kind of have to listen over and over, but that's how I learn things, by the way, you know, so I don't mind that at all. And then um, dinner time and then, you know, nighttime, sometimes I'll go back to work to the editing or sometimes we'll just do fun things like today's the Academy Award. So I'll watch some TV. It's not like I'm just, I'm not like, oh, I'll never watch TV. It's just, I, I find that the less TV you watch, and the less time you spend on social media, other than watching valuable things like this, I mean, I'm talking about just just scrolling and, you know, whatever, the more time you'll have to do things. And I, do, I generally don't get tired until my head hits the pillow. You know, if I do, this is the, the, the beauty of being self-employed is if I do, I don't lay down and take a nap, but what I'll do is I now find time during the day to do some yoga. I, I don't formally meditate, but if I ever start to feel a little stressed or too overwhelmed, I have a walk-in closet that's carpeted and I'll go in there for like 30 minutes and I'll just do some of my favorite yoga stretches like legs up the wall, which is very relaxing or pigeon or just, just 30 minutes of yoga. And it's like, it just rejuvenates me. So, and then, oh, so dinner tonight, what are we having? Okay. So tonight it's boring. Tonight is boring. You should have asked me yesterday because yesterday I taught a cooking class, a virtual one, and I had like the greatest menu, but tonight it's probably just going to be rice and broccoli with a sauce. It's, but I like simple foods now. I didn't used to, but again, when you, when you eliminate or reduce all the sugar, fat, and salt, the healthy foods, you know, minimally processed and without all the bells and whistles, they can actually taste really good to you when you're not used to assaulting your taste but so much with high amounts of fat, sugar, and salt. But even so, I'll, I'll still make it tasty. So for example, I'll, I'll do little things like I'll, I'll put like, um, you know, like I, I'll put scallions in, I'll put some raisins in. It's not like I'm just having this plump, you know, this clump of rice and broccoli. I'll put a delicious sauce on. Uh, I've been making a lot of chutneys lately, re experimenting with that. And I have a new recipe that'll come out in a few weeks. So I'll put some, maybe some of the green chutney on it, or one of my favorite vinegars from California balsamic. And if I'm hungry afterwards, usually it's dessert, uh, would be something fruit or fruit based like a jam bar or so last night, 
I was testing out waffle recipes and I, I usually don't overeat or eat past full, but, and I said, I said to my husband, I go, let's just go right to dessert. That's all I really want. Let's just not eat. We had this Mediterranean kale dish and we had this fennel apple salad and we had these roasted potatoes and it was delicious. And I'm like, let's just go right to dessert. Cause I know I'm going to eat it. I made these waffle bowls and then I put it, uh, the banana ice cream in it with macerated berries. And I'll tell you, it was one of the best things I've ever eaten. And it was like, I was like, we should have just ate that for dinner. So I eat fun stuff too. I just eat it in a way that's not processed. And once your taste buds neuroadapt, I, you know, I pe people like my food, not everybody, of course, but, but most people, because I've tested it on people like that were the cleaning crew in, my, in the, the cleaning crew of the apartment building I used to live at. I tested a lot of recipes on them because if they didn't like it, then, then I mean, healthy eaters may like it, but I tried to test it on regular people when I was the volunteer culinary instructor at the Braille Institute. So you can have a lot of flavor with a lot of, without a lot of fat, sugar, and salt. But if your taste buds are all jacked up on that stuff, there could be a period of time until which this food tastes delicious. But think about it. Could I have been eating this way for eight years? Could you know Dr. Goldhammer be eating this way for 40 years if we didn't love our food as much as you loved your food? I don't think so. We're not that heroic. We really like the food. And you know, Dr. Lyle has always said we are meant to not just like, but to truly enjoy the taste of whole natural food. But sometimes the addiction gets in the way. And that's why so many people go to the True North Health Center and do a water fast because it completely reboots the palate so that healthy food will taste good. Wow. I mean, your day is so much packed with self-care and also selfless service to the humanity. I mean, that's the perfect combination you've come out with. And I think, uh, I think they actually potentiate each other, they enhance each other. When you take care of yourself, you almost become a more productive, a better person in terms of taking care of the world. So I think big kudos to you. I think uh, keep going for next 45, 50 years. And uh, so that brings about your work. You have a very busy YouTube channel, 100,000, more than 100,000 followers. So please tell us a little bit about your YouTube channel, how people can look up, how people can subscribe. Oh, thank you so much. It's just my name, which is Chef AJ. And most of the followers came from, from the doing the daily live show during the pandemic. And there's a little bell. And if you click it, they'll, it'll notify you when I go live, which is 11 o'clock every day. But often I do a bonus show like today. I'll have one right after here. And you can also be on my mailing list because then we tell you in advance who the guests are in case you want to send in questions for them. It's a combination of wonderful doctors like Dr. Shah or chefs like his wife doing demos and sometimes other topics that seem to interest me more than often the viewers, but it's mostly a lifestyle show, you know, with, with, with plant-based doctors and plant-based chefs. And so it's a lot of fun because I get to meet a lot of amazing people like you doing the show. Also, please tell us about your books, how people can buy it. And uh, if people want to buy one book from you today, which book would you recommend? Let's see. Well, if you're German, buy this one because my book was translated into German and it's hardcover and it has pictures for every recipe. But if you're if you don't speak German, uh, all my books are on Amazon, The Secrets to Ultimate Weight Loss. I, I have unprocessed in the other room because I was cooking from it. That was my first book. And any day now, our third book is coming out called Own Your Health, where I've done 75 new recipes. And as soon as I can get this one out, then I have another one coming out in all date sweet and dessert books. So right now, Amazon is the best place to buy them. That's great. And also, please tell us about your online I think, I believe it's my wife is member of it. It's an online subscription monthly program or something. Yeah, like so so this is something, it's, it's, it's kind of nice. I think it's called Feel Fabulous Over 40. You don't have to be over 40. You don't even have to be female to be in it. And it is a membership group where we, we do a live, like, an, like a private broadcast every Wednesday at five, where you get to ask questions to some very special doctors that's in a more personal smaller way because we can see each other you know everybody on the broadcast there's people watching now but you and i don't see them but in this format we can see anybody who decides to turn their camera on and interact and once a month it's dr doug lyle where people can ask their psychological questions and once a month it's dr frank sabatino where people can ask their medical questions and then once a month we bring on a success story and then once a month it's boring old me but we've created a very nice community of people which it comes you can be in the facebook group or not one of the reasons we created it is because I was learning more and more that people wanted access to spend time with me and my community, but for whatever reasons, they were in law enforcement or maybe famous and not everybody likes Facebook. So that's we, so we were able to do this off of Facebook and there's a huge member center where 
there's now probably, I don't know, close to 100 archive videos and something that we call the knowledge base where if you have a question for me, instead of putting it on Facebook and waiting for me to respond like in the old days, like what does Chef AJ think of Air Pop Popcorn? You type it in the little chat and then it takes you right to the video, every video where I've ever said that. So that was uh, created by my partner, Toby, that's kind of cool. And then we have like not meal plans, but a meal planning tool where you take my recipes and it generates shopping lists for the different recipes. And it's, it's a very nice group of people that are very inspiring. And um, anybody that wants to try can try for two weeks free just to see if it's right for them and then still access all the great material. Wow, I think uh, I must say and I must admit that we are great fan of you, myself, my wife. Uh, you are actually truly our mentor in many, many ways. And I highly, highly recommend all viewers and all our followers to at least watch a few YouTube videos on Chef AJ. Buy, consider buying her book, definitely the book about the weight loss, and definitely reach out to some of her online programs. Because if you are trying to get healthier, if you are in need of a weight loss, Chef AJ's programs are must. So thank you, Chef AJ. We are bringing you as often as you can. I know you are a busy person, but you cover so many topics today. We are very, very thankful to you, all of us at our pace, and everybody who's going to watch this. This will be on YouTube in a few hours, so everybody will have access to it. And uh, you know, thank you, Chef AJ, again. I'm going to go offline.